My name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations at the Classic Learning Test. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with the CLT, we're a college entrance exam and assessment suite for grades seven through 12. And one thing, there are a few things, but one that distinguishes the CLT as a test is its content. So two thirds of the passages on any CLT exam come from our author bank. This is a list comprised of men and women who have contributed to the richness of philosophy and thought that we have inherited. These are authors you're likely to encounter in your college career, and hopefully you'll engage with them throughout your life. Um, you already are, it seems. So most Thursdays of the academic year, a faculty member from one of our partner colleges helps us explore one author from the CLT bank. This is what we call our Journey Through the Author Bank series. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Claire from George Fox University, who will be talking to us about Augustine. So I'm putting two links in the chat now. The one above is the CLP Author Bank, and the one below is the fantastic reading list at the George Fox Honors Program. So these are both lists really worth perusing when you get a chance. You'll see great overlap between them, for one thing. And the honors program book list is segmented in this really wonderful chronological way um, for all four years. So a note for any high school students on the call and parents and educators. Um, I can't speak highly enough of George Fox and the honors program in particular. So each honors course has this substantial reading list of great books with biblical texts woven throughout very thoughtfully, all of which have had a profound and enduring effect on Western thought and wrestle with perennial human questions, the big ones, what is the good life? How should we live? What and how should we love? So these great books provide formation rather than information, and that's gonna serve you no matter what you do in your life after college. Um, so now let me introduce our distinguished guest from George Fox, a native Oregonian. Joseph Clare followed his educational pursuit all over the world and earned degrees in both England and the United States. He became professor of theology and philosophy and now dean of the cultural enterprise at George Fox University after receiving his doctorate in religion, ethics, and politics from Princeton University in 2013. He earned his bachelor's degree at Wheaton College a master's in theological studies from Duke, a master's in philosophy at Fordham, and a master's in philosophy of religion from Cambridge, where he studied as a Gates Cambridge scholar. He is the author of two books, one discerning the good in the letters and sermons of Augustine, as well as on education, formation, citizenship, and the lost purpose of learning, along with numerous articles and essays on faith, culture, education, and ethics. In his spare time, he likes to spend time with his wife, Nora, play with his four kids, fly fish, organs many rivers, and work on his hobby farm. There will be a question period after Dr. Claire's presentation, so take notes, keep your questions close, be ready to put those in the chat. Um, feel free to not only ask about Augustine, but also George Fox University, and especially the cultural enterprise or the honors program. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and give you the screen, Dr. Claire, thanks again so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Natalie, and to all of you attendees and anyone who will hear this, thanks for your time. I'm a huge fan of the classic learning test and the classical education movement more broadly. Uh, our four kids are involved in classical Christian school here in the honors program um, at George Fox, as, as Natalie pointed out, is, is great text all the way. Um, and with a Christian worldview at its core, following the chronological St. John's approach that I know is near and dear to many hearts. It also is a core curriculum that replaces the core at George Fox and allows you to major in anything from biblical studies to nursing or engineering. And so it's kind of a, a best of both worlds for Renaissance people. So please do uh, check out Honors and check out George Fox. Um but that's not our topic for this evening. Augustine of Hippo. Who was Augustine of Hippo? Um, why is he important? And why is he important uh, for us today? That's all I want to want to talk about. And no, he was not born of a hippo, but he lived uh, most of his life in North Africa in a, in a town called Hippo and was a bishop there. 
Um, Augustine is one of those authors uh, in the history of ideas and Western civilization where you get maximum bang for your buck if you're a reader, a learner, especially in the classical world. <clears throat> there's certain figures. If you can get them down, you get everybody sort of in their wake down as well. So if you're a selective um, sort of reader of the history of ideas, there's a few big figures that give you um, the biggest window out onto the history of ideas. Augustine's one of those. Alfred North Whitehead said in the 20th century that the history of philosophy is footnotes to Plato, but I think you could rightly say the history of Western thought in many ways is footnotes to Augustine. So why do I say that? Um, well, he just was um, so very productive in his output. We have more of his writings from the ancient world than anyone else by far, more of his words, 100 books, 250 letters, 1,000 sermons or more. And he, um, Martin Luther said after Jesus and Paul, no one went on to, no one shaped Christian thought and practice more than Augustine of Hippo. So you have his influence religiously. And take a few examples of his reach. Uh, you can't understand Dante's comedy unless you understand Augustine's philosophy of love or of human desire and affection. You can't understand Aquinas on nature and grace without Augustine. Uh, the church historian theologian B.B. Warfield said you can't understand the Reformation apart from Augustine because it's the debate between his view of the church as Catholic or universal and his doctrine of grace and faith uh, vying against each other in Catholic and Protestant thinkers. The history of Western political thought has been footnotes to Augustine's City of God. Some interpreted his City of God as uh, legitimating Christendom for about a thousand years in medieval Christian Europe. And Reformation and modern um, authors have read Augustine's City of God as the legitimation of liberal political thought, lowercase l, liberal, that is a separation ultimately between religion and politics that frees politics from the pressure of the sacred and the fusion with religion that you find in the ancient world. And so anyways, you can go on and on, um, but it's very important to understand your Augustine. So let's let's do that tonight. Personally, um, I had uh, what I can only describe as kind of a second conversion, an intellectual spiritual conversion in college reading his confessions because I had fallen into a period of doubt um, and deep questioning about my own Christian faith. And the discovery of his confessions was the discovery of another mind, which is way far out beyond my own mind, for whom I could never out-question or out-think. And it was following him in his own pursuit of the deep questions from a faithful perspective that reanimated, revivified my own um, faith. And so I've kind of seen him as a dead mentor, which is kind of a weird thought uh, for the past decade, but it's been a very life-giving enterprise. So Augustine is living <clears throat> in the end of the Roman Empire, and I just will pop up uh, Botticelli's famous Renaissance uh, painting of Augustine in his um, study, uh, which I love so much. Um, we'll go back to that. There's this, this sense of Augustine here, a man of great learning um, and also great passion and faith uh, captured in Botticelli's rendering of him in his study. And for Augustine, we get the fusion, um, the marriage, the war, the reconciliation of classical and Christian ideas. He lived most of his life um, as a pagan, although he was born, uh, or not most of his life, half of his life. He was born to a Christian mother and a pagan father in North Africa, a Roman father and a, a mother, Monica, who was would have been indigenous to North Africa as an ethnic Berber um, in present-day Algeria. And Augustine's mom was following him with prayers and tears, but he was sort of running from her faith, and yet he was superiorly intellectually gifted and got a tremendous classical, what we call classical now, but a liberal arts education. He was born in 354 AD, lived until 430 
AD. And this is what we think of as late antiquity, the end of the Roman Empire. The sack of Rome happened in 410 AD in the middle of his life. So he excels in the liberal arts and um, both the quadrivium and the trivium, but especially the language-based arts of the trivium and becomes a teacher of rhetoric as his, um, his career in his late 20s. And he teaches in North Africa, and then he goes to Rome, and he excels there. And the, the mayor of Rome appoints him to a position which it finally ends up with him in Milan as the kind of imperial professor of rhetoric. So the Roman Empire was centered in Milan at that time. And this is like being the, you know, Harvard, the Kennedy endowed chair of government or something at 29 um, for Augustine. And it's here that his own intellectual restlessness and spiritual hunger um, sort of overwhelm his careerism and his sensual um, pursuits of pleasure. And he writes famously in that first paragraph of Confessions that his heart is restless um, until it finds rest in God. And Confessions is the story of this story. It's a it's an autobiography. It's kind of the first autobiography in Western history, uh, although it's very much a spiritual autobiography and tells the story um, of his own pursuit of God and God's pursuit of him. After his conversion, he enters into the process of trying to construct a Christian liberal arts curriculum. So if he's born in 354 AD, <clears throat> he is converted to Christianity in 386 AD, and he retires from his post as imperial professor of rhetoric and moves with some friends um, to start a very small Christian liberal arts academy up in the Lake district in a place called Kasikiakum to construct a uh, deeply Christian uh, version of the seven liberal arts. We have some of that. Uh, still, we have De Musica by him, so he gets at least to one of them, but he abandons this project and moves back to North Africa and founds a community of spiritual seekers there um, that doesn't have as strictly liberal arts educational focus. And then he slowly becomes involved in Christian ministry as a priest and then ultimately as a bishop. And his focus turns from liberal arts education to the work of the church. And yet I don't think he ever loses sight of the question, questions of education, of what does it mean um, to love learning? What does it mean to be formed by the liberal arts? What does it mean to connect the love of learning with love of God and love of neighbor? And so this comes out in different ways. And I feel that his, his other greatest work, The City of God, which tells the story of, of pagan history, Greek and Roman history in light of biblical history, is in some ways his attempt at something like a classical Christian education, um, where he brings together the sort of like, in narrative historical form, the riches of, um, of the of pagan civilization and learning what he calls the gold of the Egyptians and on Christian teaching these kind of treasures that came to people outside of the biblical framework and in Judaism and Christianity, just by virtue of them being human beings. Um, made in God's image, and he tries to stitch that together or reconcile it or rub it up against the wisdom of God in Scripture. So you have the wisdom of humankind and the wisdom of God, and that comes out very much in the city of God. I see it as kind of his curricular roadmap written toward the end of the Roman Empire for how you might build a new Christian civilization of learning. So if for those who come from classical, come at classical education from a Christian perspective, in some ways, I think Augustine is very much the origin of a classical Christian education. And um, his City of God is kind of the first great books program. Um, so there's that. But what's been so influential about Augustine um, for me, I think you can only understand figures like Augustine and their vast breathtaking scope and sweep, especially when you only have 30 minutes to talk about it from a very personal um, perspective. And um, so I'll take it from a personal angle. I also think this is his one big 
philosophical theological idea. So Isaiah Berlin famously writes the essay on Tolstoy that there's two kinds of thinkers. There's foxes and hedgehogs. There's foxes who are thinking about everything all the time, always writing on different things. And then there's hedgehogs who are just like have one big idea, always hammering at the one big thing. And I think Augustine was a hedgehog and his one big idea was this notion that we as human beings are fundamentally thinking creatures, rational creatures, but more than that, we are deeply loving creatures. We are affectionate creatures, affective, and we're driven by our affection and our desire even more than our rational reflection, although they'll, they relate to each other, and we'll talk about that. And that the real grand drama of the moral life, of the spiritual life, is how to reconcile this fact of being a lover, a bundle of love, as Augustine says, with the great requirements that the divine has given to human beings. And those requirements are inscribed in the Torah, um, in the Old Testament, and um and uh, crystallized by by Jesus in the New Testament there to love the command to love God with everything you have, all heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love one's neighbor as oneself. So how do you reconcile all the multiplicity of your loves, the things that you care about, the things that you have desire for, the things that are uh, patently obvious about you and also secret in your soul with the call um, to have proper healthy, ordered affection for God, neighbor, and implicitly oneself, a healthy love for oneself, which there's three things to love in the double commandments of love. Augustine so says God, neighbor, and self. So this, this big idea is not just um, the challenge of the moral and spiritual life that is properly ordering your own affections in accordance with these great commands, but he says that there's great eternal consequence uh, to um, the thing, to the shape and texture of your love. He says, ultimately, from an eternal perspective, you either are going to love God, neighbor, and self appropriately, or you're going to hate God, neighbor, and self. Um, and that'll be the sort of, the, that marks the eternal destiny uh, for you as a human being. And so the city of God, he famously says, there's there's really two cities ultimately traveling, two cities of human beings traveling through time that will be separated at the end of all things. There's those who um, love God and neighbor and self in a healthy way, or those who hate God, neighbor, and oneself. Or he says, love oneself, self-love that's so marred um, and disordered that it leads to the exclusion of God and neighbor and self. So he says, um, he says famously in this letter um, to his friend Macedonius, and Macedonius was a politician, a judge, Augustine. Um, you, you forget sometimes that to be a teacher of rhetoric and a speech writer um, was an uh, was a public office in the the ancient world in the later Roman Empire, and so he kept these connections with public officials throughout his life. In fact, we've got this treasure trove of letters that he wrote to public officials where you see him applying some of these big ideas. And he says to Macedonius um, that our character is usually judged not from what we know, but from what we love. It is good and bad loves that make good and bad characters. And so <clears throat> self-knowledge in Augustine's view requires you to take a moral self-inventory about what you actually love, what you really uh, care about to begin this great work of properly ordering your love. So in Latin for those classical buffs, ordo, O-R-D-O, amoris, A-M-O-R-I-S, the order of love. That's the challenge of the more moral spiritual life. And it begins and self-examination and self-inventory. So ask yourself, listeners on this Zoom, what do you really love? What do you care about? If we were in person, I could jot it down on the whiteboard, but my guess is that we would get answers ranging from the really commonplace and lovely like ice cream or um, you know, major league baseball playoffs or bacon or whatever do you love to nature or to learning or to Moby Dick or your spouse or your kids or God. So you, you see the flexibility of the English word love that is applied to so many different um, concepts. And Latin, 
like Greek, as C.S. Lewis famously points out in The Four Loves, has like a much more refined um, palette vocabularily uh, to talk about the different kinds of love. So Greeks have eros to talk about rom romantic attraction, desire. They have agape to talk about self-sacrificing divine love. They have philia to talk about friendship and so forth. But we just kind of talk about love in English. So it's it's massively flexible concept. But Augustine thinks that there's um, there's some slippage there that we ought to be careful um, because not everything that we love um, has the same value. Oh, I forgot I had this picture. So this is my kids a few years ago. I asked them, um, that's M Margaret um, with the stuffed animals and August with his little accordion there and piano and then Esme. Um, we have a fourth now after this, Wesley, but I asked them to bring into the, the playroom everything that they loved. And this is what they, they brought in. So we got marbles and um, we've got a tape dispenser. It's kind of a peculiar thing to love. Never noticed that before, but there's just a wide array. And I think the same thing would be true if I asked everyone um, to bring the things they love into this room. And Augustine actually loves the word uh, glutino in Latin. Uh, to talk about uh, affections where we get gluten or glue. So the things that you love in Augustine's mind are almost like they're they're glued to you spiritually or existentially. And Augustine says uh, famously that <clears throat> the the nature of our love is not so much just like um, the thing that you're you know absorbed with or addicted to, but, the things you love are the things that you give your time and attention um, and affection to. So it's you hear love and it starts to like, ah, love, I don't know. If I, but no, Augustine thinks this is like the very like direction and energy of your soul to care for and pay attention to and be worried about and uh, focused on is, is the nature of your love. So in our own contemporary setting, I like to think of what do what do I love? Well, I should look at my screen time on my phone and just <laughs> check out what I zoomed around and, and researched today on Google, or I should look at my bank account for the past month and see what I spent uh, my money on. These are like the ways in to see what you actually are like at the level of, of character. So the challenge for um, the moral spiritual life is not just that a self-examination and moral self-inventory, but ordo amoris, proper ordering of one's affections. Augustine's one big idea that comes out in the confessions in the city of God is, is kind of crisply captured in this quotation from on Christian teaching, where he says, living a just and holy or spiritual life requires one to be capable of an objective and impartial evaluation of things. That is to love things in the right order so that you don't love what is not to be loved or fail to love what is to be loved or have a greater love um, for what should be loved less or an equal love for things that should be loved less or more or a lesser or greater love for things that should be loved equally. This sounds like kind of isometric and geometric, but if you think about, um, if you think about what he's getting at, he's saying that in the world that God has created, everything has like varying degrees of goodness or densities of goodness, and therefore demand um, different levels of our attention and affection and care. Uh, and we do this all the time. Like we care, I care way more about the chickens on my farm than I do about the bugs that they're eating. I care way more about my kids than I do about the chickens on my farm and so forth. There's like this kind of the great chain of being, which is a, a concept you get out of Plato and, and with Neoplatonism. But Augustine says it's not just that there's varying degrees of goodness or being in the world, but that that, that hierarchy demands a proper affective response from us as human beings. You ought to be more enraptured with things that matter more. So you can see in this um, the great irony of disordered affection when um, when we find ourselves in a place of disordered desire, Augustine says, or addiction, you might be struggling with alcoholism and all you can think about is wine uh, to the exclusion of thinking about your loved ones or, or to the exclusion of thinking about the divine or thinking about God. And he says, these are the, the, 
the challenges of disordered affection is that we can find ourselves giving more love, more time, more attention, more resources and mental energy to things that are actually less valuable in the ultimate uh, scheme. So he says, reserve your greatest affection for the things that matter most. And ultimately those are other human beings, um, yourself in a healthy way, and ultimately God, who is the giver of all of this, this goodness and being. And so in Augustine's anthropology, as you know, he coins the term the fall, which comes from his reading of Genesis chapter three, where humans um, disobey uh, the divine, and it comes at great cost, not just um, that we're subject to death and mortality and kicked out of Eden, but he says something happens to the soul um, in Genesis chapter three. And what happens is all three faculties of the soul. And he says the, fa the, fa the soul has three faculties. Famously, you have reason, uh, you have the will or where your affections are, and then you have your memory. Um, and he says all three of these are are marred by what happens in our original ancestors there. And it's sort of mysteriously passed down to every soul thereafter, including us. And our intellects are darkened. So we have a, we have a tough time learning and we have a tough time remembering what we learned. Um, but even worse than that, we are prone um, to loving uh, lesser things as, as if they were more and better than they are. And, and worse than that, we actually are prone to loving um, um, bad things or, or things that themselves are unwhole or corrupt. We love thievery more than we love honesty and justice and so forth. C.S. Lewis writes an essay called The Weight of Glory, where he uses this idea to great effect. And he says that our hearts are intuitively drawn to love higher and higher things um, in this Augustinian sense, but they're also intuitively drawn to loving lesser things as if they were ultimate things. And he calls these idols of the heart or idols of affection. He said the problem with loving wine or loving sex or loving entertainment or something as if it was an ultimate end, as if it was God um, as an idol, is that it will break your heart because it can never satisfy the desire and the longing with which you're bringing to these temporal uh, or material or earthly things. Now, again, Gustin shouldn't be misread as a Gnostic or even some Neoplatonic writers who have a negative view of the material or earthly world. He has a very high view of the material world as being a good gift of creation because of his reading of Genesis um, in the Bible in chapter one, verses, verse 31, that there's a goodness inherent in creation. But he does think that our, the problem lies within the realm of the human heart and the human will, um, and that we love the material, the created, as if it were God um, itself, and that's ultimately frustrating. So he says um, in the City of God, book 15, chapter 22, in this quotation, that um, everything comes down to love. Uh, and that a brief and true definition of virtue itself is actually rightly or properly ordered love. So he says justice is a matter of rightly ordered human relationships and loving um, the, the desire to give each their due and justice. Prudence is having a, an accurate um, evaluation of the relevant, relative value of things and loving them accordingly temperance is properly ordered, you know, affection. He can, he can kind of read all the virtues through love. And of course that fits his scheme because he has the cardinal classical uh, virtues of prudence, justice, um, fortitude, um, and um, temperance. And, but he also has the Pauline virtues in the Bible of faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And so he reads these things as one piece Augustine also has this um, <clears throat> second sense of properly ordered affection. I'll, I'll finish on this and leave you alone. We can take questions. But Augustine says that not only are you trying to vertically order your desires, uh, and again, he's not saying it's not pure asceticism uh, that you got to stop loving ice cream and baseball and wine to love the divine. He's saying you can actually love those things 
in the appropriate way at the right time in the right place and toward the right end. And they can actually elevate the heart in gratitude back toward the divine as the giver of those gifts. And so he says, sometimes you do need to cut off if you have a raging uh, challenge with alcoholism, um, then properly ordered affection for alcohol could include an ascetic um, denial or renunciation for others. It's a matter of proper use and ordering. But I think people have stopped right there in their understanding of Augustine on ordo amoris or properly ordered love and forgot that it's not just the vertical ordering of the heart um, toward God, which is super important, but it's the horizontal ordering of one's affections for other beings, because he says the two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Augustine has this concentric circle kind of picture of horizontally prop horizontally ordered affection for others that kind of goes out radiating out from the self uh, ultimately to the ends of the world, including all human beings, be all of humanity, because who's not a neighbor that seems to be implied um, in Jesus's parable of the good Samaritan that who's my neighbor? Well, your neighbor is the person that you probably have no <laughs> um, um, blood or even religious connection to it's any other human being just by virtue of them being a human being made in the image of God. So Augustine says, Properly ordered love on the horizontal plane begins with properly ordered affection for oneself. That's that heart body center point there. So he says that our lives are, are made of a series of concentric circles of friendship. And the primordial friendship is that between the soul and the body. So he says, actually, your soul and your body need to get along. And he doesn't mean by that, that there's a hardcore dualism, but he just means that the, you can have an antagonistic or a sympathetic relationship between the goods of the soul and the good of the body. Anybody who's ever tried to go on a you know, five mile run or whatever knows that you can have a good or a bad relationship between your soul and your body. So he says getting that right. And obviously this is something that our culture has become particularly adept at analyzing whether or not we're becoming adept at um, healing <laughs> the relationship between soul and body. I don't know, but we think a lot about it. And I think that this is this um, the realm of of mental health, mental health and self care, and a holistic vision um, of physical and psychological well being. Gustin says that that kind of properly ordered affection for oneself, soul, and body requires that vertical ordering of love for God, love for the divine, and that once you get those in connection, love for self and love with love for God and the kind of like habituation and transformation required, then you're able to go out and begin to love others in a healthy way, because there's nothing worse than loving your neighbor as yourself. If you hate yourself or don't know how to love yourself, you're just not set up to even know what properly um, loving others would amount to. He says the first um, form of friendship from soul and body expands out into the deepest uh, next level friendship with a spouse uh, in marriage and that that gives rise to um, uh, to children in many cases in the formation of this new community, the household. Obviously, there's friendships um, that arise from particular interests and intellectual life associated with that um, that expand out into the city or the commonwealth, the republic uh, and political life, the world of the church or the monastery is connected. And I don't have all the rings represented in this little diagram and then ultimately to the world and the cosmos and the ancient world remember both pagan uh like the stoics um thought of the sages as these kind of spiritual creatures and the stars after they die and for augustine it was angelic beings you know you forget as a modern person that um the ancient cosmos was peopled with other rational beings uh, both pagans and christians thought that and so who knows what friendships with angels or sages means? I don't know, but they thought it was real. And so um, Augustine has this idea that for you to grow, for the soul to mature in love, it will expand and that you will begin to take on the needs and concerns of those away outside of yourself as if they were your own. So the moral injunction implied in this picture of the concentric circles of friendship is that you will draw those in the outer circles closer in to yourself and take on their concerns uh, 
as if they were your own. Now, of course, Augustine knows there's limits to that. You cannot treat every neighbor you meet on the face of the planet as if they were your own child or even yourself. And so um, Augustine's got these great letters um, to Christians and leaders in the ancient world about some of these dilemmas. My favorite one is letter 262 to Ecdicia, this woman, this aristocratic Roman woman. And she had um, become so spiritually zealous that she'd taken a vow of celibacy and poverty, which is a good thing if you're moving into a monastery. But the problem was she was married with children. And so her husband, and she did this without her husband's permission. So she was giving away their goods and um, didn't want to have sex, obviously. And so this was like a big rift. And so Augustine writes to her and says, you know, these commitments um, to love others and to seek spiritual, you know, um, purification. She was trying to give away their goods to take care of the poor. He says they have to be reconciled with these more immediate um, responsibilities and obligations that you have within these smaller, closer um, concentric circles. That circumference relates to your ability to go out and um, love others. Hence why those who do take say the vow of celibacy poverty and live in community and don't have family are actually um, unleashed to go love more distant neighbors as if they were um, more near because you don't have some of the responsibilities of the household. So this is his kind of way of socially horizontally thinking about properly ordered love and this kind of reconciliation of affection with the great command um, of of God that Augustine um, likes Jesus's rendition in Matthew 22, there you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, Sermon 299D has this um, picture sort of nicely worked out and um, we'll finish with this, but he says the necessary goods in the world amount to these two things, health and a friend. These are things that we should value highly and not despise. Health and a friend are goods of nature. God made man to be and to live, that is health, but those but so that he shouldn't be alone, a system of friendship was worked out. So friendship begins with married partner and children and there moves on to strangers. But if we consider that we all have one father and one mother, Adam and Eve, his reading of Genesis, who will be a stranger? Every human being is neighbor to every other human being. Ask nature, is he unknown? He's human. Is she an enemy? She's human. Is he a foe? He's human. Is she a friend? Let her stay a friend. Is he an enemy? Let him become a friend. So what is health for you must also be health for your friend. As regards the friend's clothing, whoever has two shirts should share with the one who has none. As regards the friend's food and whoever has food should do likewise. You're fed, you feed, you're clothed, you clothe. So this is this um, grand call to... Um, expanding the circles of friendship. Um, I'm droning on and on about Augustine, but I'll summarize in saying um, that for Augustine, there is um, this profound unity between the two commands to love God and love one's neighbor. And that in the process of properly ordering your affection for the divine, mm -hmm and properly ordering affection for the neighbor, whether it's your own body or your spouse or the distant uh, stranger who's an enemy or impoverished on the other side of the world, that in this mysteriously, the two commands become one. So Augustine loves to preach and you get a bit of this in that, that sermon that we all are called to love God. The challenge with loving God is God is a mysterious dude. Um, there's a, loving the unseen and the unknowable divine being, uh, even though that God has made um, himself known in the concrete revelation of incarnation in the face of Jesus, it's still a pretty mysterious deal. He says the most tangible way to love this God is to love the neighbor who's right in front of your face and that you can mysteriously reach the divine through the face, um, the person of your neighbor. And so there's a unity between the double commandments of love and that the properly proper ordering of one's affection ultimately leads to um, a kind of wholeness of life. 
the the questions I'm I'm left with in that is in Augustine's kind of forceful, evocative exhortations to love uh, the stranger, the poor, the enemy. Is what are what are the limits to that call to action and to love? Like how many people can you love? And there's studies right now in social psychology that I find so interesting of like trying to figure out what that number of people you can actually like care about is. There's famously this Oxford psychologist Dunbar who came up with the Dunbar number that you can only actually care about 180 people. I don't know if that's true, but I think our information saturated social media generated age is actually testing the limits. Um, of uh that intuition of how much how many people can we care about and is it is um retweeting and reposting you know global concerns um to one another actually um a form of justice or neighbor love or is it actually just overwhelming us and um taking us away from the more immediate practical uh, concerns of loving the neighbor who's right in front of us, uh, maybe even our own self for a season, if that's a challenge. So Augustine of Hippo, 354 to 430 AD, very influential, pivotal um, figure in the history of Western thought, obviously in the history of, of Christian thought. And his famous works, um, the confessions in the city of God go on to shape just about everything that you will read um, app that comes after the 4th, 5th century AD and shows up on the classic learning test. So thank you so much for your time. I'd be very happy to take any um, Q&A, comments, pushback. Thank you, Natalie. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, to give, while well, you all take a minute and, and put your questions in the chat, I wanted to put something in the chat as well. You do have the chance if you're on the call to win a copy of Augustine's Confessions. I think we just heard a couple angles of just fantastic recommendation to read this book. Um, it's for those on the call, not not watching the recording. Commonwealth, not the world. But uh, <laughs> there we go. And while they're taking a moment, I think I'll actually ask the first question since I have the chance. And this is about confessions. Um, while you were talking, I was thinking about this one aspect of Augustine's conversion in the garden or after the garden um, that he has. He, he talks about something like a revelation in the garden, right? He hears a child's yeah. voice yeah. singing to him and he attributes this to God. Um, but the the voice is saying, take and read, tole lege. Um, which strikes me as kind of strange for a revelation that it's a directive to go read a book. <laughs> so then he reads the Paul's epistles, Paul's epistle to the Romans, and then it's something like conversion happens or simultaneous with that. I don't know. Um, so I have a few questions that you can just kind of choose from about, sure. about that sure. strange aspect of his revelation. So one would be, does it, does it say anything about reading kind of in general or does only about scripture in particular? Um, and does it say, what does it say about the nature of his conversion and kind of what he needed to convert? Maybe that would relate to his vision of the faculties, um, the kind of anthropology of understanding memory and will. I don't know, you could take up any of those directions if you want to. Yeah, thank you, Natalie, those are... Deep questions. I, I think um, that's a very important point about his conversion that it's around reading. It's, it, I mean, it's mysteriously like he hears the voice of children playing a game, but in the game they're singing tole lege, the take up and read. And the historians don't, I mean, you know, we don't know everything about the later Roman Empire, but we don't know of a game like that. And so it's clear that this is almost like a supernatural. It's not clear if he really hears kids saying that or if it's like a, um, a sort of divine uh, voice that he hears. And it sounds like children's voice playing, singing a song. But the bottom line and the really powerful, um, the powerful point there is that that's the culmination 
of a series of episodes and where reading changes Augustine's life. So read the confessions and keep this in mind next time you read it. Look to see what books impact Augustine and change him. So it's what, what I love about it and is why it's very like classic learning test sort of appropriate is it's not just the Bible that is the culminating converting moment when he has the letters of Paul, but he he discovers Cicero's Hortensius in Confessions 4 in his like course of liberal studies and rhetoric, you know, where he's learning how to like use the craft of words to convince other people to do things. Um, and then he's like Hortensius, which was Cicero's protreptic in the ancient tradition of philosophy, which was like an exhortation to pursue wisdom above, you know, just money and career and all these things. And he says that that book changed his way of feeling. It changed him. It actually says it changed his prayers. He's not a Christian yet. So it's not even clear, like, what are, what are his prayers? But that book, Cicero, changed him in a deep way. Then it's his discovery of the, the books of the Platonists, the Libri Platinacorum, the not Plato, but the Neoplatonists, probably Plotinus and Porphyry that convert him away from Manichaeanism, this cult, this very materialistic view of reality to spiritual truth through the Neoplatonists, um, and so on and so forth. And so the conversion book eight is his hearing these stories of other people who have read things that change their life. And then he hears the story of people who read the life of Antony, probably by Athanasius, and were changed by that. And then he reads, he or he's thinking about Athanasius's life of Antony, and Antony goes into church and cracks open the gospel and reads it. And it says, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me, the rich young ruler story. And Antony does that, moves out to the, the desert as a, one of the original desert fathers in Egypt. Then Augustine cracks open the letters of Paul in Romans 13, stings him and converts him. So clearly, it's not just that, oh, reading is important, but he's an inheritor of this legacy of how encounters with books will change your life, change the trajectory of your very being, including uh, the climactic moment of spiritual transformation. And so I think that's a great call, a reminder, whether it's classical or classical uh, conversations or classical Christian, whatever it is, is like the deep art of reading is being lost in our hyper infotainment, distracted attention deficit era. And the call um, to deep reading, reading where you bring yourself fully to the work of paying attention and listening, obviously reading the right things, hence why it's good to have a, a canon of some sorts and great authors to look at things that are worthwhile to pay attention to. So yeah, I think I could go on and on about the spiritual art of reading. I do think he's inheriting an ancient tradition there, but he's clearly doing something um, really new with it. And yeah, that's the key moment when he cracks open the letters of Paul. So good question. We'll get to the soul stuff if we have time. Sure, sure. So we have a, a question from Claire that is asking for a description of Augustine's evolution on free will versus God's ordination of events. Um, wasn't Augustine a primary influence on Luther and Calvin regarding God's sovereign predestination? So I don't know if the question is um, like the evolution of interpretations of Augustine or if it's assuming there's an evolution in Augustine's own, Augustine's own thought. Away. Yeah, it could be both, but there's there's evolutions on both fronts. He, he writes on the free choice of the will early on, and it seems to be I think a fairly straightforward um, account of this notion that human beings freedom of choice and freedom of will is definitely marred and weakened and limited by sin, by the fall and is bounded by God's own sovereign power and will. But there's this kind of remainder for human free will. And then the question is, of course, like, does God foreknow what humans will do and then respond to it? He leaves these questions of foreknowledge versus predestination open. Later in his life, as he gets into this deep debate with um, Pelagius, partly, um, but also um, the followers of Pelagius, famously Julian of Aclanum, 
And Pelagius and Julian are almost stoic in their perspective on human free will, that something happened maybe in Genesis 3 in the fall, but we're basically still on the level playing field um, of human free choice, and your salvation is up to you, and you need to use your will to pursue the good and get back to God. And um, Augustine increasingly thinks that this is a very uh, dangerous reading um, of Scripture, and not only is it wrong because it doesn't adequately account for the damaging effects of sin and the weakness um, of the human will, but it nurtures a kind of Christian perfectionism and um, judgmentalism, which he thinks is inimical to um, the Christian life. And so he he famously has almost like a defense of Christian uh, imperfection and weakness, and therefore a lot of grace and charity for your fellow human beings who are caught up in this common weakness that you find yourself. And so there's a kind of humility um, in recognizing oneself and the weakness and failure and folly of others because we're all caught in this common destiny and common weakness. So later on, he becomes sharper and sharper, and his latest writings are just on these questions on grace and free will and other anti-Pelagian writings, where it basically is predestination, God's formal sovereign choice rules all. And it's not totally clear what the remainder for human free choice is, which would mean people are predestined to go to heaven for salvation, but maybe people are even therefore predestined to go to hell if God has total sovereignty. And this gets into these great medieval and reformation debates about what does that mean? Is God just this sovereign dictator or did he know the way people would choose and therefore like retroactively made them act in certain ways uh, to go to heaven or to go to hell? And you get the um, the debates about God's foreknowledge um, in the reformation era. Uh, middle knowledge is a version of God's foreknowledge, and uh, double predestination is the view that John Calvin um, takes up and sort of espouses, which some people see as authentically Augustinian, other people see as hyper-Augustinian, like taking Augustine too far. It's one of the fascinating things about Augustine, Clara, is I would just say read Augustine for yourself, read on free choice of the will, then read grace and free will or one of his really late writings, he evolved over time. He did. He grew. He rethought things. He writes his last work is called Retractions, where he reads back through his whole corpus and talks about where he changed his mind, where he was right or where he was wrong. And I mean, so he had a kind of self-referential awareness that he had been changing and evolving over time. And I don't think he sewed everything shut in a lot of ways. So it was a great question. But yes, Calvin in particular goes with Augustine on what he calls double predestination. I thought there was another question, Natalie. Um, where did I see it? I think there's one hidden away in the Q and A. Oh from yeah. The chat. So that's uh, was it Augustine or Aquinas who said disordered love is sin? Yeah, Augustine first, but Augustine mm-hmm. uh, Aquinas is an inheritor of Augustine who follows Augustine later in the 13th century but aquinas is so interesting because he knows augustine knows all that we've been saying tonight but then he reads aristotle so augustine didn't have aristotle at all he didn't read greek very well um and there was no aristotle in latin other than the categories in augustine's life and so it's not until islamic philosophers in the 12th 13th century rediscover aristotle and he's translated into latin that really people start trying to wrestle with like, well, how do you bring this stuff about disordered sin and grace together with Aristotle's view of virtue and habit formation? Um, And, um, you know, and that's just a moral kind of ethical question, but there's lots of other questions about creation and matter. And so Aquinas's great intellectual improvisation is to reconcile Augustine with the wisdom that is discovered in Aristotle in the 13th century. You mentioned a few recommendations, uh, particular to Claire's question, so about free will, grace and free will. Um, If a student asked you just, I want to read Augustine, I haven't read anything, uh, or the first couple things I could read, what what do you tend to recommend? Yes, I would say 
um, the confessions and I'm, I'm just a huge fan of, um, uh, this translation by Maria Bolding. Um, I'll put it, I'll put her name, the translator in the chat. Um, she was a Benedictine nun in England and, um, translated tons of Augustine's works and it's just so, so, so beautiful. It's the vintage spiritual classics edition. Um, and also the New City Press edition, which is the works of St. Augustine in English. Um, and that's the place to start. I think especially for those who are teachers or students, because in some ways it is the story of Augustine's liberal, classical, liberal arts, classical education, but it's also about the ways in which that can go wrong. So he famously talks about like the intellectual pride it cultivated in him and the sort of vanity of his teachers debating, you know, arcane, you know, facts and points about knowledge that had nothing to do with true wisdom or true virtue and uh, living a whole life. Um, and in some ways, it's like a story of his miseducation. He goes away to college in Carthage, and he falls into what he calls a cauldron of boiling disordered love. And so, I mean, just all these, he's a moral realist. Um, and I think it's a good antidote to just thinking like, oh, if we just rediscover the quadrivium and the trivium and read the classics, we'll be better people. It's like, nah, not for Augustine. He talks about reading Homer and Virgil and wanting to imitate the gods um, <laughs> and how that wasn't a totally good idea for him as a young man. So, um, and then how he tries to reconcile that with his reading of scripture. Uh, it's just beautiful. And then his relationship with his mom, his conversion. And then, and then strangely, if you can figure this out, you could write a doctoral dissertation, but he turns after his conversion and the death of his mom in book eight and book nine to a long meditation on memory. That's famous in book 10. And you've probably seen that as he talks about time and he talks about memory. And of course that makes sense because he's trying to remember his whole life over the first nine books, but then 11 and 12 and 13, it's like a very detailed, but um, imaginative reading of Genesis chapter one for uh, three long books. And yeah, his analysis of time is mind blowing. Um, to Claire, people credit him for having the first like robust psychological account of time. So people have thought about time as, you know, it's like it's movement, it's cross, it's the physics of time. But I guess it's talking about why do we experience time so differently? Why is time long? Why is it short? Why is it connected to our own sense of self? And uh, yeah, so it's, it's mind blowing. But why does he dip into like a and, you know, a tedious, very close analysis of Genesis 1. My only hypothesis, and I think I heard this from a teacher, is that he's beginning the process of, like, how would you stitch your own life story remembered into the grand story of the divine, um, the big story of salvation? Well, you would begin at the beginning with Genesis 1. So um, it's an interesting thought. And in some ways, City of God is an extension from his own story of confessions to the story of human civilization and stitching that together with the biblical record as well. So uh, just read Confessions and City of God. City of God has a few good translations. Penguin, um, Bentworth, I think is good. And then I like R.W. Dyson's Cambridge uh, translation, but anyone that you can read is good. The City of God is much tougher sledding than the Confessions and it's very long thousand pages in English. So um, do what you can. The other two, if you have more of an appetite from there, On the Trinity is his third most famous work. It's this deep, beautiful meditation trying to understand the triune God, which is a tough thing to understand. Um, and then on Christian teaching or De Doctrina Christiana, which is his idea of like, how would you teach the Christian faith? But it really is in some ways, I think the culmination of his thinking about rhetoric. So how would you communicate um, the truth of anything? And by this point in his life, he wants to think about how do you communicate effectively the truth of the Christian faith, which he thinks is kind of the heart of truth. So, yep, those four, but start with confessions in the city of God. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I'll ask one, but kind of last call for the chat if you want to put a question in. Um so you mentioned one question that Augustine leaves you with uh, at the end of your, your presentation. You talked about the limits of love and affection, I'm wondering what those are. You've written a lot about Augustine, so I, 
I was wondering, um, what are some other questions that you you bring to reading Augustine or are left with, maybe? Yeah, that's oh, that's good. I I've never been asked that. I like that. I think I think this question um I think the question that I'm left with that I see most clearly kind of worked out in his letters uh to public officials and military commanders and different forms of leaders is how do you how do you bring the eternal perspective this kind of city of god you know sort of end goal that um you know christians at least ought to have as kind of the purpose this high-minded sort of desire to love god and love your neighbors yourself how do you bring that into the nitty-gritty reality of your daily obligations and responsibility um, uh, to your work, your vocation, your kids, your friends. And I, I think in Augustine's mind, it begins in very, very simple, simple spiritual practices and habits like meditating on a bit of scripture every morning or devoting yourself to some practice that retunes you to um, to the divine, to God. And there's a philosopher at Calvin University in Michigan named James K.A. Smith, who I highly recommend all of this stuff to you all. But he wrote a kind of popularized version of Augustine's theory of ordered love called You Are What You Love, the spiritual power of habit, which I think that's the question I'm left with. And I think Jamie does a great job in that book. I think there's more to be said, but how do you actually take all these high minded, like, you know, eternal city and love of God and actually like get it into the fabric of the way you, you know, drink coffee and eat oatmeal in the morning and interact with the people you see first. And um, it comes down to the work of, of habit formation. All true virtue is born in very simple Monday and little habits and practices. And so that's, that's what I'm left with. The other thing is faith and reason i think augustine was able to um embody and model the kind of restless hunting pursuit of the mind the intellectual life that's like um ask honest um honest questions without any intellectual shortcuts but he did it in a faithful way in a spirit of reverence and awe um and um uh devotion and i think getting that right like how do you be just intellectually ruthless and honest and ask the hardest questions but do it in a spirit of humility and faith seeking understanding as as augustine said so um yeah that's that's good yeah those are those are the lifelong ones those are it yeah (laughs) i'm gonna keep thinking about the that picture of your kids was so great. Um, I love that he included not only a, a tape dispenser, but a stapler as well. Mm-hmm. He likes bringing things together. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Well, I wanted to put one more thing in the chat and before we go. So I have two resources for everyone here, but especially um, high school students or parents of high school students. So one is the George Fox admissions email address. Um, Big thank you to them for helping organize, coordinate this event. Uh, I know they would love to hear from you. Any questions you have about the programs at George Fox or just a a chance to introduce yourself and and thank them for their participation with us. Um, That's available to you. The other one below, um, that would come to me. So the One of our kind of informal values here at the CLT, I think, is making connections. Uh, We talk to admissions teams like those at George Fox every day. Um, So if you have any questions about college preparation or you're looking for a particular program or you have an interest in a program at a a partner school of ours, 
feel free to use this email address, collegeconnect at cltexam.com, and we'd be so happy to, to get you a personal introduction to someone at a partner school. Um, so thank you again to George Fox admissions team. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. This was really wonderful. Really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending. You all have a good night. Agree. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you.